Okay, so how are you doing? This is Nehemiah Networking, and we have a video that I want to highlight in the um, in the Trinity debate. This gentleman, his name is Inspiring Philosophy, has a video that has 47,000 views that, that's called The Trinity Explained with Reason. I want to go through the video and I want to explain how I disagree and why I disagree with that preface that um, what he's explaining is within reason because it is not and um, and go from there. So we're going to listen to a little bit and then I'm going to critique what he has to say. Here we go. But with explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. Likewise, I've heard atheists and people who believe in a Unitarian God attack the Trinity as confusing, illogical, and polytheistic. They often bring up the idea of God being Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, yet all one being doesn't seem to make sense. When I was agnostic, the Trinity didn't make much sense to me either. That was until I actually studied the concept of the Trinity and the attributes of God. In research, I saw that the Trinity did make sense, but I also discovered that the existence of a Unitarian God is actually the concept that is illogical. Only a Trinitarian God can account for the unique attributes that make God who he is. Okay, so we're going to stop right there. His first few statements in 44 seconds is that he has understanding that the reason that is that he found out that a Trinitarian God is the only kind of true God that there is. That if there was only one God instead of a triune God, that that is actually in, impossible and cannot be God. But what he's failing to understand is is that the biblical view of God in the Old Testament prior to the New Testament and Jesus' uh, appearance is that they all believed in one God. And he's saying believing in only one God is not good enough. And it's impossible for God to be God if he's only one. Where in the Bible does it say that? He's making a claim. What is the biblical basis for that? Where in the Bible does it say that if God is only a one being God, that it is impossible for him to be a God or to be the God, the creator, but in fact that we have to have multiple gods, otherwise it's impossible. Where does he get that information? Because in the Bible it says nothing of the sort. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, A hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one. So what he's saying is that he found out through all of this research and all of this study that apparently that verse is wrong. It's what he's pretty much saying. He's saying, I have studied and come up with uh, all this, you know, through research and study and time and the whatever. I've come up with the understanding that a Trinitarian... A Trinitarian view of God is actually the only un, only true understanding of God and that it's actually believing in a one, in one God is absolutely impossible and is in no way and can in no way be true. But let me just reiterate the fact that Trinitarians are constantly trying to fit three persons into one model so they're trying to say father son holy spirit let's jam them all into this one title god and call them the same entity and person and everything else that is the essence of the trinity because if they cannot bring them together into one entity then they're actually polytheist that would mean that they're actually worshiping three different gods but because that is absolutely wrong, because the entire Old Testament does not agree with that viewpoint, they have to do everything in their power to shove them into one title. So for this man to say that the Trinitarian model is the only model that would be 
worthy of any kind of consideration as God, and that in fact, if he was only one, that would make him that would make it impossible for him to be God, is so anti-biblical in ideas, uh, in, in ideal idea is not that idea is not from the Bible. It's not part of the biblical understanding of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he has to be multiple faceted person to be God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. In fact, the reason why they're not tri or polytheist is because Deuteronomy 6.4 is a stumbling block to them and they have to force everyone into Elohim and say that we only worship one God but he has three persons. Do you understand? That is why. So for him to say that God has to be, I mean, it's totally ludicrous. But he says it with such flippant, like, belief in what he's saying. And, and, and people just eat this up. They have no idea what the Bible says. They just, oh, wow, that sounds awesome. Totally wrong. Let's move on. First, let me start by saying that the doctrine of the Trinity begins with the belief that the true God is not totally comprehensible. Any God we could fully understand and explain, like a Unitarian God, would be an entity that is no greater than what we are. Okay, so what he just said there was that if we can understand God, then he is not God. He's saying that if we can understand God, then he's not big enough to be God. Okay, Bible says God is not a God of confusion. God is not a God of confusion. What he's saying is that God always produces confusion. He's saying that God is a confusing God. He's saying that there is no way to be able to understand God because God has to be so big and so ununderstandable that he is God. If I can understand God, then he can't be God because he's supposed to be beyond my understanding. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God has to be ununderstandable. The concept of God is not ununderstandable. It's very basic. And it's and it's easily to be understood. God is all powerful. God is infinite. God is immortal. God is all powerful. Uh, he can do anything. He can say anything. He can see anything. He can, I mean, anything. There are no limits to him. He is limitless. That's easy to understand. We don't have to get any more complicated than that. God is a pure God. And he is holy. And he is easy to understand. Bible says God is not a God of confusion. But this man is saying that that scripture is wrong. And that's where the problem comes in. He's saying that that verse is incorrect. God is a God of confusion is what he's saying. That is what he's saying. And it's ridiculous. A Unitarian once told me that God was just a spirit. Well, if God is just a spirit, he would be no greater than the angels, since that is all the angels are. Lucifer may have had a chance in the war in heaven if God was just a Unitarian spirit. Okay, so here we go with God is just a spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What this man is saying, again, is that that verse is incorrect. He's saying that it's impossible for God to be a God that is spirit, even though the Bible declares that he is spirit. Who said that? God is a spirit. Jesus said that. So for him to say that Jesus was incorrect in his statement that God is a spirit when he is speaking about his own father is absurd. On top of that, This man does not know. He said that spirit, uh, that angels are just spirit. 
and that Satan could have somehow defeated God if they were the same. Well, first of all, angels are more than just spirit. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 1, you will see a description of living creatures. These living creatures have wings, have four faces, have a wheel, wheels uh, beside them. And the Bible says that wherever they go, you know, they go straight, you know, either wh whatever direction they go. But it talks about how the spirit of the living creatures is in the wheel. So that would mean that what they are made of or consist of or their, their you know, what he is seeing is not just spirit. He's the spirit is within the wheel and he is seeing the living creatures and where their spirit is. So that would mean that where they are themselves, the wings and the faces and everything, is not necessarily, is not their spirit for sure. I don't know what they're made out of. I don't know what their form is. But I know this, it's not just spirit because their spirit's in the wheel. So first of all, can't limit them to that. But second of all, he says that Satan, if they were the same, which obviously they're not, but if they were, that Satan could somehow defeat God. Well, that is ridiculous because he is ignoring the fact that there are differences in authority. And I'm going to say, if I design a 3D creature uh, in a game on my computer and I decide to use that 3D creature to destroy all the other creatures in my 3D game world never will that 3D creature no matter how powerful he is in this world that I design will he ever be able to turn around and destroy me I could delete him very easily so the my point is is that I understand how this creature was made. I understand the software. I understand the power source. I understand the computer, the 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 process of the computer. Um, there's so many facets of ways besides the fact that he's in a three-dimensional world within a computer and I'm in a w world out here in a different, totally different dimension that he's under so many controls. There's no way he could destroy me. For God, he has so many more levels of understanding and authority. But either way, never, ever, ever can we say that because of some sort of similarity that Satan could somehow defeat God. That is absurd. It is ridiculous, and it shouldn't be listened to. I don't know where he gets this. This guy gets this stuff from, but it's unbiblical. Spirit, because God will be on the same level as Lucifer, but God created the angels, so he must be more than just a spirit. So how can we learn who God is? By simply studying his attributes. Every monotheistic religion claims that God is omniscient. Well, if God knows all, then he must be able to see everything. And if God sees everything, then he must be everywhere at once, which would make God omnipresent. Now, if God is omnipresent, he would have to be greater than three dimensions, because three-dimensional beings and anything in the third dimension cannot be omnipresent. Therefore, for God to be omnipresent, he must be comprised of more than three spatial dimensions. Okay. Now, let's just say that... God is not limited by any of these rules. Like, let's say he's saying scientifically there are three spatial dimensions, maybe four spatial dimensions in the universe, maybe more. And he's saying that because there are these limitations, these dimensions, then God must be able to, um, must have to, like, submit to each and every one of those dimensions and be controlled or under the rules of those dimensions. And that is, in fact, not true. And you may say, well, 
pre, uh, you know, please prove it. Well, very easily. Jesus walked on water. God allowed that. That's not following the rules of water and gravity. It's not. Healing the sick, raising the dead, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, creating uh, the universe out of nothing by a spoken word. I mean, there's so many different things that we could go into to prove that he's not limited by what we're limited to. We're limited by these rules, gravity, life, death, oxygen, food, these things we need. The sea, the earth, the rotation, the orbits of the planets, all of these things are set by God and they are ruled by those things that God has set in place. But God himself is not limited by those things. It's not like God says, oh, you know what? I wish I could move this sun about two inches this way. Or, you know, or I wish I could move, you know, like the sun stayed up longer so that Joshua could go to war. He broke the rules and I'm not sure exactly how he did it, whether he stopped all of the planets and the universe from moving so that Joshua could win the war. I'm not sure. But what I am sure of is that God's not limited by the rules of time space. So this a being beyond three dimensions and has to be this and has to be that. That's our own mental human finite. I'm trying to understand something that I'm just, just over my head type thing. He's forgetting that God is not limited by the rules of dimensions, the rules of any of those things. He's not ruled by any of them. He can step through a wall. You know what I'm saying? He's not limited by those things. We are. Now, I'm not making this idea up. There are more spatial dimensions than the three we live in. At the end of the 19th century, they discovered the concept of hyperdimensions, which are realms that consist of more spatial dimensions than three. If God is omnipresent, he would have to consist of more than three dimensions and be hyperdimensional. How many dimensions does God consist of? Well, if you're going to take the Bible's word, then he is infinitely dimensional. Isaiah 40, 28 says, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. So what does God being hyperdimensional have to do with the Trinity? Let me just say that that verse says nothing about being hyperdimensional. It says the depths of his understanding are, are his the depths of understanding him are beyond we can never fully know God okay we can never fully know God as far as the magnitude right of his almightiness the magnitude of his all powerfulness it's we're never going to be able to fully understand that just like We'll never be able to fully understand our mothers or our brothers or our sisters or everyone, anyone, because we are learning from them. We are growing with them. We are always gaining new knowledge about them. We're assessing. We're always being introduced to more and more facets of this person's personality and being. God is the same way. We're never going to fully know God. We're never going to fully know anyone. Always changing, always growing, always um, doing something else. So it doesn't mean that we're not going to understand the basic concepts of likes, favorites, desires um, at the moment. Uh, things about that person in the present time. We will never fully know God, but what I'm trying to say is that that verse had nothing to do with being hyperdimensional, okay? 
he's saying that because God cannot be understood fully at one time, that because of that, we have to accept hyperdimensional God. He's beyond hyperdimensional. Hyperdimensional is a is a earthly concept. God is beyond that. He is outside of that realm. He doesn't even he, he doesn't even exist in any dimensions. He has he owns dimensions. He created dimensions. He created everything. So he's not subject to those things. Nothing. He could destroy dimensions altogether if he wanted to. What I'm saying is God, nothing is impossible with him. And just because we understand dimensions and hyperdimensions doesn't mean that God has to be hyperdimensional. And then on top of that, he has to be three gods or three persons in one. I mean, that has nothing to do with the Trinity. He's going off in the left field with some sort of scientific understanding and trying to bring it back home so that people can understand it. And he feels like he's super intelligent when in fact he's coming up with these weird, unbiblical ideas. will allow me to explain. Hyperdimensions are not going to make sense to our finite minds. However, luckily, we can explain this using the example of taking a cube and trying to translate into a two-dimensional world. Take a look at this cube. Because we understand three dimensions, we understand the spatial parameters of this cube. But if we were to encounter a being living in a two-dimensional world, he wouldn't understand this cube at all. He would look at it and see it as just a square. We could then try to show him that it is actually a cube by turning it to show him another side. But his mind could not comprehend changes made in three-dimensional space. So to him, the change would look like this. The green square disappearing and the red square appearing. The two-dimensional being would then say, hey, that's a different cube. We would say, no, it's still the same cube. He would say, no, that can't be right because I see a different square. And we would say, well, yeah, it's a different square but it's still part of the same cube. We could then show him all sides of the cube and tell him that all six squares he saw were all one cube. Yet all he would see is six squares disappearing and appearing before him. He would not see the cube rotating from one side to the other, so he would not see the cube in its entirety or be able to imagine the physics and the shape of the cube because it exists in a higher dimension than he does. All he could do is trust our word that the six separate squares he saw or actually part of one object called a cube. So is this starting to sound familiar? This is exactly the same way God tries to explain himself to us. Clearly, he is omnipresent, meaning he is hyperdimensional and beyond three dimensions and beyond our spatial understandings. Okay, so let's just go with this. We have this guy showing this cube to a two-dimensional being and saying that, you know, he's not able to understand this, you know, this cube being the same, uh, whatever, because he's trying to speak from a different realm, and that's why we don't understand God correctly, right? The Trinity. Okay, which, I mean, it sounds great. Yeah, you know, um, the Trinity is a cube, and, you know, we're just, just too um, small-minded to understand. But... Let's just look at, let's just use that um, analogy. First of all, just because you can apply an analogy to a concept doesn't mean that that an analogy applies to that concept. It's called the fallacy of analogy, and you should look it up. Just because I can make an analogy does not mean that the concept that you are marrying the analogy with doesn't mean that they are one and the same thing just doesn't mean that so what we need to recognize is that it's a great analogy it sounds good it it let's say it's possible it's possible it could be true but it's not for sure we need to look into it a little further so let's say that those three cubes that that two-dimensional person saw um, were when he'd see the blue one let's say the blue one says I'm this and when he sees the red one the red one says I'm not this I'm not 
I'm not the same as the blue. I'm different. I am from the blue, but I am not the blue. I am something else. And for the yellow to come along and say, yellow, I came from both of them, but I'm not them. I'm different from them. And for the, you know, for the blue to say, I'm greater than they are, and one to say, I'm not the same color as this one. You know, it's, I'm not from, and I'm not same part. I, I, I know th I'm not the same part. I mean, it would be ap applicable if they didn't have this problem where each color was saying that they were not part of the same cube. Okay? The problem comes, the, the analogy says all three colors or all six colors are all the same cube. Look, look, look. All these different colors are the same cube. Okay. But if each color is saying, I am not part of the cube, each color is saying, I'm not part of the cube, I'm not part of the cube, I'm not part of the cube, then there's a problem. Because each part of the cube is saying, each side of the cube is saying that it is not part of the whole cube or that it's not the same cube. So the problem would be the person presenting the colors to this two-dimensional man and saying this color is the same as this color, they're on the same cube and blah, blah, blah. But every time he speaks to each one of those colors, each color says they're not the same. So that's where the confusion comes in. If everyone was saying the same thing, if each color said, yes, I'm part of the same cube, okay, then it would make sense. Each color is obviously the same cube, and I can understand that from where I'm looking in my two-dimensional world because each color is telling me that they are the same cube. Good. I understand that. They're all the same cube. But if each color on the cube, every time... I was presented each different color told me that they were not the same or that there were differences like this cube is a little more rounder than that cube this cube is square and this cube has some rounded edges that don't fit with the other cube with the other cube shape that I saw necessarily but I'm being told that they're the same that's where the problem comes in and that is where the problem is in the Trinity the Son says I'm not the father Father says, this is my son, which means I'm not the same. I made him or I, I begot him. He's my got, begotten son. You know, I'm going to send you another comforter. You know, there's all these things that are happening, but it would make sense. And it would be so easy to understand if it were, if each side of this Trinity were saying the same thing. If the Trinity, if God, the son said, I am God. Don't be confused with the Father because I'm Him too. We're the same. Never they do that. So that's where the problem comes in. It's not the same analogy. He's saying that each color I'm showing you is the same cube, but the problem is, is that each color on the cube is saying I'm not the same cube. That's the problem. Not whether or not there are three in one and I can't see the whole cube. It's that each side of the cube says I'm not that cube that's the problem so God is explaining his form to us in hyperdimensional terms where the physics allow beings to be more than one person yet we are still thinking in terms of three-dimensional laws where all beings must only be one person but since God is beyond the third dimension he would have to be greater than it meaning it would only make sense for him to be more than a unitarian being like we are now how monumental is this well, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the science of hyperdimensions like we do today. So they came up with the term Trinity to try to explain to the world what God had told us about himself. This is absolutely monumental because when man makes up a religion, he makes up a God he can understand and make sense of. Only in the Bible do we see a God that... Okay, first of all, he's saying when man makes up a religion, he makes up a God that he can understand. And that's why the God that we follow is not is the real God because we didn't make a God that we could understand. Otherwise, if we could understand him, it's because we made him to where we could understand him. Well, 
He's saying, I must be confused to understand that this is a real God. I must be confused. He must make me cross my eyes and scratch my head to understand him. And that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. Okay? And he's saying that he must be hyperdimensional because they weren't smart enough to know about these hyperdimensions. That, like, hyperdimensional understanding is like the key to all God understanding. It's ridiculous. This is the first time I've even heard of hyperdimensions with this guy. So whether they're hyperdimensions or not doesn't matter to me. What matters is, is that he's saying that this that God has to be ununderstandable, which is ridiculous. It doesn't have to be that way. And God, you're, we say that nothing is impossible with God. So we're saying that it is impossible for God to make us understand Him. It is impossible. He's saying. For God to be understandable. Like nothing's impossible with God. But this we cannot understand. I mean it doesn't. It's just not. That's not biblical. I mean I can understand where he's coming, getting all these different. Theories and putting them together. But where in the Bible. Does he have any scripture that backs up. That we must understand a God. That's just too hard to understand. That my eyes are going to cross. And I feel stupid. Where does it say that? It's beyond three dimensions and beyond the understanding capacity of humans. A hyperdimensional idea that was unknown to people 2,000 years ago. This is why I came to understand that other monotheistic religions have an illogical view of God. When you actually take the time to evaluate the idea of God, only the God of the Bible makes sense. So now this brings up another question. If you're watching this and believe in a Unitarian God, you might be asking, why is God only three persons? Why not five, or ten, or a million persons? Well, the answer is simple. He is revealed as three persons for our sake. Three is all that is needed for God okay. to show us that he is... So, where is there biblical proof that three is the only amount that we need? 